This is a podcast of Forest Lake Baptist Church Sermons. If you'd like to know more about our church, visit our Facebook page or our website at flbc.org.au. We hope you're blessed by this message. We're continuing in week two of the QB series, Queensland Baptist series, Everyday Disciples. Last week, John uh, Sweetman came and pricked. Don't put that up yet. They don't need to say, oh, that's on that side. You get a different picture to me. That's very cool. I didn't know that. All these years I've been here, I didn't know that. Uh, yes. So he did counting the cost. And we're going to come back to that again today because the passage that we're going to look at again calls us to count the cost. But as we count the cost, asking the question, what tools have we been given to do this journey? And last weekend, I did a very special journey with a couple of other guys. In fact, 5,000 of my closest friends. As we did the uh, ride, we rode our bikes from Brisbane to the Gold Coast. We, this is the bit where you go, ooh. Okay, we'll try that again. We rode from South Bank to Southport. Yes, there was Lycra. I'm sorry for that mental image you now have. And let me tell you, first 40 kilometers, it rained on us. Thank you. That was what I'm hoping for. At 40 kilometres, of the 40 kilometre break, we stopped, where everyone was stopped in this park as a rest break, and we'd been told that at the rest breaks there would be some drinks, there'd be a bit of food, energy food to keep you going, and there was nothing. Sure, there was nothing, except a whole bunch of really good riders going, who needs it anyway, and kept going. So we stopped for a few minutes, we had a drink of water, we got back on our bikes, and as we rode out, we were like, this is no good. We were told there's going to be energy snacks. And then we rode about 500 metres down the road and found that there was actually the rest stop there, not in the park. And they had all the energy snacks, but we'd already stopped. So we kept going and the people who were stopped laughed at us. And it was all very funny and all very good. I thought 40 kilometres was hard because it rained. The rain stopped, praise God. But in, re in return for a stopping of rain we got a headwind for the next 60 kilometres. And it was really hard. But can I tell you, one of the best things about doing it was doing it alongside some other people. And we could laugh and we could encourage one another. And I couldn't have done it without a push bike, obviously. And I couldn't have done it without the mechanic who fixed my bike up. And I couldn't have done it without my mates with whom I rode. And I couldn't have done it without the organisers of the event. As much as I would like to think I did this on my own, it's just not true. I did it because of a bunch of others. I did it with tools in my life to get that done. And in the Christian life of an everyday disciple, we have to ask ourselves a question. This is really what we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at. What tools has God given us? And the greatest tool that God has given us is his word. And we're going to look at that today. And today's topic is immersed in scripture because scripture is one of the great tools, perhaps the greatest tool that God has given us apart from himself. And so Paul writes to Timothy, a young friend of his. Paul's writing from death row. He's writing to Timothy, who is a pastor of a very difficult church. And he writes this. All, these are almost the last words recorded of Paul. And this is most important for him, and this is what he comes down to. And he says this, You, however, Timothy, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learnt it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Just like John said last week, we have to count the cost as Christians. And we st the passage starts there with Paul telling Timothy, hard times are coming, Timothy. They will come for Christians. Jesus never said, become a Christian and your life will be super easy. 
Jesus never said, become a Christian and everything just becomes smooth. No, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. And Paul lists off some of the stuff that he's gone through. He says, you know about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions and sufferings. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul actually lists off some of the things he endured for being a disciple. He says, five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a day and a, a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Paul doesn't tell Timothy about his sufferings to make himself look good. He actually tells him about his sufferings to show I am legitimate. It's a mark of authenticity of Christianity that we should expect suffering. And any preacher that ever tells you otherwise that somehow become a Christian, have more faith and you won't endure suffering is lying to you. It's actually a mark of the authentic christian that we will endure suffering and it doesn't mean we'll all be shipwrecked it doesn't mean we're all going to get the 40 lashes minus one it may mean though that there are times in our workplaces where we have to have to stand firm on what we believe it may mean sometimes when people want to do something that's not right and we say well we're not going to do that and they rebuke us about it they have a go at us about it there are times when we will share that we are a christian and people will laugh at us because they say we have a crutch and in those moments, Paul says, rather than go, oh, woe is me, our attitude should be, thank God that I get to share in the sufferings of Christ. Is there anything that could be more countercultural to the world in which we live now? And Paul says, I've endured all this. And because of this, you shouldn't expect any different, Timothy. Count the cost. Paul is writing this from death row. In effect, what he's saying is, I'm going to be gone soon, Timothy. But you, you keep going. You keep going, Timothy, and expect it to be hard. And obviously, Timothy's going to ask the question, well, if you're going to ask me to do this journey, what tools do I have? How can I know to stand firm? And he says, well, first of all, know who you're discipled by. Because the truth is, we're all discipled by someone. We're all discipled by something. One of the things that's changed with the world of social media is we are now discipled by so many different things. We're discipled by Facebook, by TikTok, by Truth Social, by Instagram, by Sky News, by the ABC, by CNN, by all the other things that come in our world that tell us what we should think and what we should believe. Our friends, our family, our past, our fears, our hurts, disciple us. But Paul says to Timothy, and I love this word here in verse 14, but as for you, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Why? Because you know those from who you learned it. Look at the fruit of the people's lives that you're going to be discipled by and say, do I want to look like them? Do I see fortitude? Do I see love? Do I see peace? They're the people you want to be discipled by. And he uses this word, continue in what you have learned. Don't turn away from it. Don't go on to something new. Stay with what you've been given through Jesus. And that word, continue, really stood out to me as I was reading this. Because oftentimes when you look at different versions of the Bible, the Bible was a, New Testament was originally written in Greek. They translate different words, different ways, right? But this word is translated the same way by everyone, continue. And it's actually the word meno in Greek, which is the word abide. That Jesus uses when he says, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. It's a word that when Paul talks about faith, hope and love, abide. But the greatest of these in, is love, faith, hope and love, abide they continue they are grounded they are firm they're not going anywhere and paul says you christian you who have put your faith in jesus ground yourself 
on the truth of what you know to be true because you have seen the fruit of it in the lives of those you trust. How is that true, we say? How, how can we know that's to be true? Because they have grounded it in verse 14, 15 on the Holy Scriptures. Now, what did Paul mean when he talked about the Holy Scriptures? For us, we go, oh, we know what that means. He means the Bible. Paul didn't have the Bible. Paul had the Old Testament. But it's interesting that later on, T uh, Peter will also refer to the writings of Paul as Scripture. So that already by the time of the early disciples, they're listening to what Paul's saying. They're looking at his conduct. They're seeing the fruit of his ministry. And they're saying, the words that come from Paul are not just the words of a man. They're the words of someone who's hearing from God. And I know that for a lot of people, we have some trouble with, well, how was the Bible put together? What's the history of the Bible? We don't have time to go into that now. But we did a seminar on it last year at church. And if that's something of interest to you, if you would like to know, well, how did the Bible come together? How did we end up with saying, this is the word of God? Then come and see me or send me a message after the service and I'll send you the notes from that. I'll send you some resources. Because far from looking at the history of the Bible and saying, well, I don't know that I can trust it. When I look at the history of the Bible, I come away from it going, yeah, thank God for this book. Thank God we have it. Thank God we have the words of Almighty God written down for us and how privileged we are in this country not just to have it in our own language, but to have multiple versions of it in our own language. We are so blessed. And Paul says to Timothy, you stand firm. You continue on what you have learned and what you have become convinced of, A, because you know those from who you've learned it, you've seen their lives, but also how from infancy you have known the scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We all need this, right? This is how we do the life of a disciple. This is how we do the walk of a disciple. This is how we get immersed in scripture. Not just personal devotion, although personal devotion is essential and it's good and it's important, but it's done in community. There are people in this church who will see me say things or do things and they will come to me and they say, hey, Mark, I heard you say that or I saw you do that and I want to say to you, brother, I'm a bit concerned about you. I don't think that's lining up with scripture. Praise God for them. I need them. You need them. One of my favorite things to happen after a, a preach of a Sunday is when someone comes to me and says, you said this in your sermon today. I see it differently. Praise God for that. Just don't do it straight after the service. Give me some time to have a sandwich and a coffee, then talk to me. I'm no good till I've had a sandwich. There's no sandwiches today? Well, there's no second sermon, is there? Record it, put it up for them at the second service. See, we, we have become so consumeristic in the modern church. We have become so take, 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 just feed me, Mark. I'm going to say something to you. And you may not agree with it, and that's okay, because everyone's entitled to be wrong. It is not my job to feed you. It's my job to point you to the food. Get one of these, get your phone, get you version, get some other Christians around you, and do the work yourself. Why? Because when you do the work yourself, instead of it's just, oh, that's something that Mark said, you discovered it. You did the mining. You found the gold. And that's why Paul says to, uh, to Timothy here how you have, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Not that you were just taught by someone else, though he was. You have known them. Because he says, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, what do we mean? This is really brief. What do we mean by all Scripture is God-breathed? This is something that Christians for decades, well, in fact, hundreds of years, have debated what this means. How did God inspire the Bible? And again, if you want to know more about that, come and see me. I'll give you those notes. There's about five different ideas or understandings of how God moved the writers of the Bible to write what they wrote. 
But however you understand the mechanics of what God did to get these words onto these pages so that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through them, the fact is we believe as Christians that these are the very words of God. And that God himself, the one who breathed, the one who spoke the world into existence, the one who breathed life into Adam and he had life, the one who breathed life back into Jesus' body after he had come down from the cross and brought him up to, a t to life resurrected, the one who has breathed life into our mortal bodies that we have eternal life is the same God that breathed the scriptures for us. And so we shouldn't be surprised that when we read the Bible and the light goes on and we go, oh, it's like I've had a conversation with Almighty God. The reason it feels like that is you just did. But here's the mistake I think we make as Christians. I come from, uh, uh, I guess, a tradition of reading the Bible, which places a high regard for the Bible. Praise God for that. The church in which I grew up, the sermon was always the center point of the, the service. Praise God for that. I was taught from a young age to regard the Bible highly. But the Bible is not an end in itself. And I think there are times in the church when we think learning the Bible is actually the end in itself. But if you read what Paul has written here, it's not right. Read again that, that verse there in verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for what? For teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training, and for equipping. Reading the Bible is not an end in itself. The point of reading the Bible is not so that we get more head knowledge and feel so superior and proud because I know stuff now. If we do that, we've actually made it about ourselves. James puts it this way. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks at. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it. Same word. Keeps going in it not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. See, the point of reading the Bible is not just to read the Bible. The point of reading the Bible is to do what it says and to put it into action. And there, one of the things that often gets said in church life is, oh, the, 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 it's not very meaty. I don't really know what that means. It's not very meaty. And I wonder sometimes if what we're actually meaning when we say it's not very meaty is, I just want you to keep feeding me when actually what probably needs to happen is you need to start doing it. See, reading the Bible is what I've had to learn about weight loss. Energy in equals energy out. If I try to do what God wants me to do, if I try to do the exercise without feeding my body, I will run out of energy. I will burn out. I will just run out of gas. Spiritually, I will run out of gas. But if all I do is feed my body, but never do anything with it, then I'm just becoming spiritually obese. God wants us and has equipped us and has empowered us and has inspired us through the Holy Spirit as we engage with his word, as we are immersed in his word, not just individually, but as a community, then we will put it into practice and God will work powerfully. For too long, I think, in the Christian church, there are times when we have made reading the Bible so important. When we've forgotten the second part, then go and do it. Because it's in doing it that we find the truth of what we just read. For the person who for the person who just thinks they've got it all together, they think they're sigma, they're up there. This is the, the Bible is the thing that says to them, you are but grass. To the one who is struggling with illness, the Bible says, my heart and my flesh may fail, but the God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. To the person who is uncertain, the Bible says, 
God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To the grieving, the Bible says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. To the proud, the Bible says, who are you, O man, to talk back to God? To the one who wants to hold on to ang uh, anger, the Bible says, forgive as you have been forgiven in Christ. See, the more that we put it into practice, we more the more we find that there is power in the Word of God because it's inspired by God and it's used by God in our lives to tell more people about God because that's what He is about. Augustine of Hippo, I don't think there's a Christian scholar who has ever come from a better place than Hippo. Augustine of Hippo said this, anyone who thinks that he has understood the divine scriptures or any part of them, but cannot by his understanding build up this double love of God and neighbor, has not yet succeeded in understanding them. Anyone who, is, anyone who thinks they have really gone into the Bible, anyone who really thinks they know their stuff, but it doesn't result in loving God and loving neighbor better, hasn't really understood them at all. Friends, the challenge today is this. Being immersed in Scripture, this is, you might have seen that we we're going to talk about being immersed in Scripture and thought, oh, this is going to be one of those sermons about, oh, just read the Bible more. Well, if you're not reading the Bible, you should. Like, you really should. A, because it's good for you, and B, it's amazing. But I think the real question in the modern church today is this. It's less about reading it and more about putting it into practice. So when we read, love your neighbor, we actually go and do that. When it says, care for the poor, we actually go and do it. When the Bible says, forgive someone who's hurt you, that we actually go and forgive them. Because it's in that space that we truly find the power of God's word. Earlier this week, I just had a, um, a couple of days. I'm not going to go into details. Don't ask me about it afterwards. I won't tell you. Just had a couple of days where I was just really, really discouraged. A couple of a few things happened. Nothing. And if I, you know what? If even if I told you what they were, you would be like, "What is your problem? You ever have those days?" We even wonder why is this thing getting me down so much? It's not that beat. And then you get down about getting down, right? I sound like James Brown. You go down and down, and I just felt melancholy. I felt discouraged. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I even I looked at our church and I went, "Is God even really at work?" What a nonsense! We've had eleven baptisms at church camp for goodness' sake. And a hymn came to mind that we used to sing when I was a kid. We don't sing it anymore because the tune is just too hard. It's called "He Who Would Valiant Be." It's a great hymn, and it has a line in it. He who, he who besets him round with dismal stories will but themselves confound he strength the more is. I told Catherine about that and she said, I don't even understand what that means. Amen. What it means is expect as a Christian for discouragement to come your way. It will come. But the one who is grounded on the word of God will find his strength in God. Why am I not surprised that the person who wrote those words was an author by the name of John Bunyan, who wrote the story Pilgrim's Progress, about whom it was said, if you cut him, he would bleed Bible. If I get cut, I want to bleed Bible. If we get cut, I want us to bleed Bible because it's the foundation. So what can you do with this today? What can I do with this today? I've got some ways that you can respond. First of all, think in, do think individually. If you're not reading the Bible at all, get started. The, the um, Uversion Bible studies that QB have put out are good. They're not meaty. They're not deep. Someone said to me they're not very... I didn't find the first one on counting the cost very deep, Mark. I said, well, did you count the cost? And they went, what do you mean? Don't think the problem is the Bible study. It's actually applying it. 
join a life group. We've uh, Catherine has started a, a thing called Discovery Bible Studies, which comes from Dan and Mel, and we can tell you more about it some other time, where you just get together with a couple of other Christians and you just have three questions that you ask about the pass, passage each week. And you just let God speak to you through the word. Perhaps you are at a point in your Christian life where you have been around it for a long time. You do know the Bible really well. And you're looking for more. It may be the more you're looking for is actually teaching someone else. And if that's you, come and see me afterwards. Because we've got a bunch of new Christians in the church. They need discipling. They need someone to sit down with them and read the Bible. And they need someone to show them how to read the Bible. That could be you. But for all of us, I think the application is this. If we are to be immersed in the Bible... It's not just reading it to understand. It's reading it to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that Paul was an example of someone who counted the cost. That he was someone who was immersed in the Bible in his intellect. But it didn't stop there. It went to his heart and he acted it out. And we are the beneficiaries of that. And so, Father, we heed that today. And we want to live it out. We want to read the Bible more. We want to understand it more. But not just for the sake of understanding, but so that we can put it into practice so that more people can come to know Jesus. We want to live out what the end of that passage is there, that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Would you do that in us, we pray, not for our sake, but for your glory and for the sake of those around us. Help us to be thoroughly equipped immersed in scripture. In Jesus' name. Amen.